by Pastor Wayne to give us this morning's message. <laughs> it's humbling to hear that passage being read and uh, so many amazing things in this passage. I feel inadequate to be able to present it all to you. We spent a lifetime studying Romans uh, chapter 8 uh, and, and just the truths that uh, that is in there. And so you know, it's great to worship with you this morning, uh, especially if you were able to make it to retreat. Um, you know, hopefully uh, this Sunday feels maybe a little bit different uh, as with all the, you know, relationships that we're able to make during a retreat. Um, that, and I really hope that as a community, as a church, that we can really love one another as God has uh, called us to, right? And we can really be the church uh, that God has called us to here in Philadelphia. Well, you know, as a uh, community of believers, right, everything that we do should be infer- informed by God's word. And so let's look at what God has to say to us this morning through Romans uh, chapter 8. Um, did I put the wrong PowerPoint in the, uh, in the, I might have put the wrong PowerPoint in the doc, but I think this is from last week. But we'll let, <coughs> we'll let AV team uh, sort that. But I want to do a little bit of an extended, uh, you know, a little bit of a longer introduction just because, you know, we haven't been in Romans uh, for the past two weeks. And just to kind of remind us where we are and kind of sets, sets us up for next week as well. So, you know, the theme of uh, the book of Romans is this right here, right? The righteousness of God in you, right? The righteousness of God in you. So throughout chapters one through three, right, the theme is the wrath of God, right? The wrath of God was the theme uh, let's see if this works. <clears throat> the wrath of God, yep. So the wrath of God is the theme in chapters one through three, right? So Paul kind of carefully lays out this uh, argument that he has that we are all under the wrath of God, right? So if this is our condition, right? So when we are born, if we are under the wrath of God, if this is truly our condition, then chapters four and five, right, explain to us that salvation then cannot be by works, Right? If we are all under the wrath of God, salvation cannot be by works. Right? It has to be by faith. Right? Because if it was by works, if we can earn our own salvation, then there's no reason for Jesus uh, to come. Right? And so for chapters, you know, in chapter 4, through the example of Abraham, through chapter 5, through the example of Adam, right, Paul lays out plainly that we cannot be saved through our obedience to the law. Right? We are saved by faith uh, through grace. And so, therefore, when Jesus, when God looks at us, right, because we are saved by faith through grace, when God looks at us, he sees the righteousness of his son, right? He sees the righteousness of his son in us, and we are able to be treated as sons and daughters of God, right? And so, I'm going to get back to that point in a moment. But then, in chapters 6 and 7, right, you can, one of the ways to think about these chapters is to think about them as uh, the no longer chapters, right? And so, you know, chapter four is Abraham, chapter five is Adam, and then chapters six and seven, we, I kind of framed it as this is like, how are we to think about the Christian life, right? So if we have been saved by faith uh, in Christ, how are we supposed to think about our, this new life that we have in Christ, right? How, do we, how can we think about the Christian life? In chapter six and seven, you can kind of think of it as these, you know, long, no longer chapters, because 6 and 7 tells us that we are, for example, no longer under the law, right? We're no longer uh, slaves to sin. We are no longer under a curse. We're no longer dead. We're no longer under the flesh, right? And 6 and 7 is all about this new life that we have in Christ, and Paul explains it by saying this is how it's different, right, than the old life that we had without Christ, Right? This is what we have been separated from. And so, chapter 6 and 7 really helps us understand uh, how the Christian life is different than our lives before Christ. Right? We are no longer that life that we had before Christ. This is the new life we have in Christ. Right? And that's chapters uh, 6 uh, through 7. And then, you know, it's really important to know what we are not. Right? It's really important to uh, describe what we are not. And, but What can we then say positively about the Christian life, though, right? Like, it's great to help us think of what we are not, but what are we, right? How can we describe the Christian life? What can we say about who we are, right? And this is where chapter 8 comes in, right? So 6 and 7 is this is what we are not, but then chapter 8 describes this is then who we are, right? And it's really important 
because if, even if you have your ESV, if you have your Bible, if you look at the title, you know, that's, it's not biblical, but the editors added that in to help us, you know, in our Bible reading. But that, that title says, Life in the Spirit. Because if you want to think about who are we then in Christ, right, we have to think about it as a life in the Spirit. And in chapter 8, right, when Paul is explaining this is who we are now, he primarily talks about our new life in the Spirit. Right? Chapter 8 is all about the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. And I have to say that, you know, having been you know, a pastor for about 10 years, I have to say that I, feel, I find that uh, there's not a whole lot of clear understanding about the Spirit. Right? There's not a lot of, you know, if I were to ask you, okay, what is the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Right? I find that, you know, not a lot of people have a very good understanding of the Spirit's role, the Spirit's work in our lives. And well, I guess it's my fault because I'm the pastor and I should be talking about it more. And so, you know, but in, in, them, in some ways I want to talk about this. You know, I probably should be talking about it more because how does Paul explain what the Christian life is like? He explains it as it being in the Spirit. Um, you know, sometimes I still hear, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit being referred to as a, you know, as an it. You know, something referred to the Holy Spirit as an it or we refer to him as an impersonal force. Right? But Scripture clearly tells us that the Holy Spirit... Right, is the third person of the Trinity. Right? He is God himself, equal with the Father and with the Son. And the reason why Paul spends most of chapter 8 talking about the Holy Spirit right, is because um, all three members of the Trinity have a role to play in our salvation. I think it's really helpful for us to, to see this. And so right, we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But each of the th- persons of the Trinity has a role to play in our salvation, right? God the Father is the one who plans out our salvation, right? For example, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave, right? God the Father is the one who plans out our salvation. Jesus, God the Son, is the one who makes salvation possible, right? But then it's the Holy Spirit then that applies that salvation to our lives. And what I mean by that is that it's the Holy Spirit that makes salvation a reality, in our lives, right? Jesus is the one that dies for us. God's the one that plans it. God the Father's the one that plans it, but the Holy Spirit makes it real. The Holy Spirit applies salvation to our lives and to our hearts. And so if you take a look at chapter eight, right? Paul's explaining what is this new life that we have in the Spirit? And he has a lot of different things that he says. So, you know, Tim preached us preached to us last week, right? In chapter eight, it says in verse two, he frees us from sin and death, right? So Jesus is the one that dies for us, Right, but then the Holy Spirit is the one that comes into our lives and actually frees us and gives us the ability to be free from sin and death. Right, verses 2 and 3. Verses 4, he enables us to fulfill the law. Right, so remember when we were in chapter 7, right, that whole chapter where Paul's like, you know, I do what I don't want to do, the evil that I don't want to do, I do, and the good that I want to do, I don't do. You know, it's just like that wrestling that he has, and he's like, I have this desire to want to do good, but I don't have the ability to carry it out. Right, Paul's explaining his Christian, this Christian wrestling that he has. But then in verse 8, right, it's the Holy Spirit that works in our hearts to give us the ability to obey the law. Right, we have the desire, but the Holy Spirit works with us to give us that ability to walk in obedience. Right, then verses 5 through 11, I'm summarizing a little bit more now, but the Holy Spirit changes our nature. Right, Jesus doesn't change our nature. Right, Jesus dies for us. He makes it possible so that the Spirit in us then changes us. Right? He causes us to set our minds on things of the flesh. Or not set our minds on things of the flesh, but to set our minds on things of the Spirit. Right, and, then for chapters, and then verses 14 through 16, What the Holy Spirit does is that he confirms our adoption as sons and daughters of God. And I I just talked about this a little bit, right? Like, when God looks at us, right, because of what Christ has done, uh, when God looks at us, he sees the righteousness of his son, Jesus, right? And therefore, we can be treated as sons and daughters of God. Right, because when God looks at us, it's, it's, it's Jesus' righteousness uh, that is in us. And this is the wonderful doctrine, a biblical doctrine of adoption. You know, if you, and, and the way that you, you can maybe think about this right, is like Jesus is the true son of God. Right? Jesus is the true son of God. He's described in that way. And we, as children of God, are adopted into his family. Right? And Tim shared, us, shared, shared with us two weeks ago, this is why we can call Abba Father. 
Right? And I love the way that Tim described it because, you know, Abba Father, we shouldn't think of it as, you know, just calling dad, uh, to calling God daddy, right? Because the emphasis of Abba Father is not the casual nature in which we can approach God. But the, the, the reason why we can call Abba Father, right, is because of the intimacy that we now have with God. And, and the crazy thing is, like, you know, the only people that can say Abba Father, right, are the people that have such a close, intimate relationship with God. And if you think about it, when Jesus says, Abba, Father, right, when he calls his father, Abba, Father, and he says that we can do the same thing, what that means is that we now have that same intimacy with God the Father as Jesus has with God the Father. That the relationship between father and son, the intimacy that they share, we get to participate in that as adopted sons and daughters of God. Right, and so, and so that's just amazing to think about, right? This whole concept of adoption into God's family, right? That we, can, we get to participate in the love between God the Father and God the Son. And we can also cry out, Abba, Father. Right, so this is the first, you know, 17 verses uh, as a, a little bit of a summary, right? These are all the things that the Holy Spirit does in our lives. And, I, and to this morning, as we look at our passage, I just want to add one more thing. All right, so one more thing, just to summarize 18 through 30. Uh, there's a lot there, um, and maybe I should have preached through this even slower uh, because Romans 8 is just amazing. But uh, to summarize, uh, basically, uh, 18 through 30, uh, this, is the ne- this is the other thing that the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit gives us a hope that is eager, patient, and persevering. All right, so these are all the things that the Holy Spirit does in our lives, right? This is how God, Holy Spirit, applies salvation into our lives. And the one, and the one thing for us to add to this morning is the Holy Spirit gives us a hope that is eager, patient, and persevering. So let's take a look at how Paul starts off this section, right? So Romans 8.18, it says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. You know, I really appreciate how in the middle of this, you know, great section, right, that's all about the Holy Spirit's work in our lives, Paul doesn't pretend that life is going to be great all the time, right? Sometimes when we describe the Christian life, right, when you think about, hey, what's the Christian life supposed to be like? You might think, oh, you know, God's on my side, God's with me, my life is supposed to be going really well, it's supposed to be, you know, peachy now that God's with me, right, there shouldn't be less suffering, you know, we kind of think of the Christian life as this, you know, rosy picture, but even when Paul describes Right? The, what does life in the Spirit look like? Right? He doesn't hold back. He doesn't pretend that life is just great all the time. Right? And in fact, he's realistic you know, about the fact that we're going to all go through suffering. And this is you know, actually verse 17. It says, And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, right, this is the adoption, provided, and then he says, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. And what, he, what he's saying is that suffering is simply an expectation. Right, that we have to have in this life. Right, and you're going to hear me say this you know, throughout the years, but we don't preach the prosperity gospel here, right, which lies to us saying that, the, that true Christians will only experience wealth and health because the Bible clearly teaches that the part of the Christian life is, is suffering, that just as Christ suffered, we're going to suffer with Christ. Right? Verse 17 is clear as day, that if we're heirs with Christ, it's a given that we will suffer like Christ did. Now, it's amazing. This is where verse 18 is amazing, right? Because Paul says, whatever the suffering that I'm going through at the present time, it is not worth comparing with the glory that will be ours one day. Right? If you think about that, right? It's like, how do you think about your suffering? Right? How do you think, when you're going through a hard time, how do you think about your suffering? And Paul says, I, I, I look at my suffering now, right? And it's not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us one day. Now, I don't think Paul is minimizing his suffering, right? Paul's not saying, oh, my suffering doesn't matter. My, dus- my suffering is not a big deal, right? But he's saying that when I look, even when I look at the worst of my suffering, it's still not worth comparing with the glory that is ours one day. And so if you're, re- if you're at retreat, uh, Pastor Mike, our retreat speaker, talked about this uh, as well, right? If you remember, he talked about how, you know, when you put something on the schedule, 
Right? You tend to look forward to it. Right? So if you, you know, if you put like, you know, if there's a vacation on your calendar, right? or if there's an exciting dinner for you to look forward to, or you know, you know, your Amazon package is arriving, you know, and you get the notification. I, don't know, I always get excited when I get a package, even if I'm ordering hangers, you know, it's like, hey, I got a package, that's exciting. You know, but you know, it's like something, when you have something on the calendar to look forward to, right, it can actually change your present reality. Right? It's like when you have something, when you're excited to go home because you have something there, right? it changes how you experience life presently. You know, so uh, I think another way to think about this is to think about um, prequels. Um, and so recently, Amy and I finally found some time uh, to watch uh, Rings of Power, which is like the Lord of the Rings thing on Amazon. I don't know if you guys... I feel like the more I preach, the more I realize that my entertainment tastes are completely different than everybody else's. But, you know, so I was watching uh, Rings of Power, and just like every other pastor in, like, the entire world, like, all of us apparently like Lord of the Rings, and I don't know why, but we all just do. Um, you know, I mean, one time, like, I sat down with some friends, and we watched 11 hours of Lord of the Rings. We watched the tr original trilogy extended edition. We started at 10 a.m., and we ended at, I think, 11 p.m. Or, or something around there, and it was great. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, this is the best day ever. Uh, we, we got to watch it, and, you know, even, like, the Hobbit trilogy, like, some people, it was like, oh, I didn't like it. It was too slow, you know, but that's not me. I was like, where's the extended edition? <laughs> like, I want to watch that one, you know, so anyway, so no, we're, anyways, we're watching, you know, The Rings of Power, and it's basically a prequel, right? And so you have the trilogy, and you have the prequel, and at least the first season kind of sends, centers around Galadriel. You know, she's like that uh, scary elf. I don't know if you guys know Lord of the Rings, but she's like that scary elf that appears to Frodo and gives, her, gives him that, that, that light in a vial, right? So she's like, like kind of scare, that scary elf. And anyways, and so throughout... Yeah, you know, Rings of Power, right? It's all about Galad a lot of it's about Galadriel. And throughout the season, the writers try to put her in these like really dangerous situations, right? Like she's like fighting off a troll, or she's like fighting a bunch of orcs, or she's like stranded in the middle of the ocean, right? They, they try to write in these like super dangerous uh, things for her to be in. And the thing is, like me watching, it's like it's not as exciting because I know she's not going to die, right? Because, like, she's going to appear to Frodo in, like, a, thousand, it's like a couple thousand years or whatever the timeline is. Right? It's just, like, it's, it's not as exciting because you know she can't die, right? Because she has to live in order to be in part of the next one. And this is, you know, I, heard, I read an article about this is why, like, you know, I don't know if you like guys like Star Wars, but this is also why, like, Solo, like, that movie didn't do so well because, like, Han Solo's in all these, like, dangerous you know, positions, and you're like, yeah, but he's not going to die because he needs to appear, you know, later on, right? And so I kind of think, the reason why I'm telling you all this is because um, what if, right, what if you were to think of your life right now, right, as simply a prequel of what is to come? Right now, it doesn't mean that you minimize, right? It doesn't mean that life now doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that we don't, you know, love and serve. And it doesn't mean that suffering doesn't matter. But what if we were to think of our lives as simply a prequel of what is to come? Because in some ways, I think this is what Paul is saying here. Right? The reason why prequels are boring is because we already know what's going to happen later. But in a way, that's what hope is. Right? Hope is the certainty of what we will experience in eternity. Right? And what if we were to think of our, our, our lives right now simply as a prequel of what is to come? Because that's kind of what Paul is saying. Right? He's saying, for I consider that the, present, the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us one day. In many ways, we know what the ending is. Right? In that way, it can give us, it can make all the difference right, in the midst of our present suffering right now. Right? And this is the hope that the Holy Spirit gives us. Right? It's a hope that is eager for future glory. Right? It's a hope that is eager for what is to come. And that's what, you know, in some ways, that's what suffering can do in our lives as well. Right? Suffering can make us eager for the life that is to come. You know, I think a lot of times when we're suffering, you know, we can only think of the present. Right? When we're going through something hard, we can only think of what's going on right now. But I think what God is saying and what Paul is saying is what if we lift our eyes right, off of our present suffering and we are able to see the future glory. Right? I think only then can we say with Paul right, that these present sufferings of these present times are actually not worth comparing with the glory that is one day will be revealed to us. Yeah, you know, I think sometimes, you know, when people suffer, they, you know, they end up hating God. You know, like, why, why would you do this to me? But what if instead we direct our anger at sin? Right? Instead, what if we direct our anger at evil and the corruption in this world? Right? Instead of being angry at God, 
In many ways, we should be angry alongside with God, right? Angry with, at sin, angry at what it's doing to us, angry at what it's doing to the world, right? In the midst of suffering, right, the Holy Spirit can give us a hope that is eager for Jesus to come back and return and to set things right. Right, so, you know, it's interesting that in talking about our future glory, right, Paul's saying, you know, this future glory that we have, and Paul couldn't help in the midst of this to talk about uh, the future glory of God's creation uh, as well. And we're not going to talk about, too, we're not going to linger on this too long, uh, but I do think it's, you know, it can help us as well. But, you know, when, as Paul talks about this, he, he, his mind kind of goes to, you know, thinking about creation and about the, about the suffering around the world, about the corruption on the earth, right? And so it's really interesting that he draws this parallel between our future and the future of creation, the future of this world that we're living in, right? So if you take a look at verse 19, he says, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And so if you think about all the way back uh, in Genesis chapter 3, right, where the, you know, Genesis 1 is creation, Genesis 2, like stuff are, you know, going on, you know, Adam and Eve are in the garden, and Genesis 3 is the fall, right? Genesis 3 is the fall, and within Genesis 3, there's three curses, Right, one curse is towards uh, the serpent, right? And uh, the sec- so one curse was to the serpent. The second curse was towards Adam. But what's interesting about the curse for Adam is that it also includes creation and all mankind. Right? So actually, if you've been reading through the uh, Bible reading plan that's, that we've been starting as a congregation, you probably read this not too long ago in Genesis chapter 3, that creation itself is under the curse of sin. Right? And this is where it talks about how it bears thorns and thistles. Right? The earth is supposed to just bear good fruit. But because it's under a curse, it, it, it has these thorns and thistles and weeds. Right? That's all part of the curse of along creation. And then, you know, so there's three, and the third curse is to, to Eve. And part of that third curse includes the pains of childbirth, which is really interesting because Paul mentions that in verse 22, right? So as I'm reading, if you look at this chapter, right, I think it's pretty clear that Paul actually had in mind Genesis chapter 3 when he was writing this, right? This is almost like Paul's reflections on Genesis chapter 3 and the curse. And what Paul is saying here is that because of the curse, you know, everyone is groaning, right? Men are not happy. Women are not happy. The earth is not happy. Satan is definitely not happy. Creation is unhappy. Everyone is groaning. Everyone is not uh, happy. And, and everyone, well, maybe besides Satan, but everyone is yearning for glory, right? Everyone is yearning for things to be restored, things to be better. And this passage is really unique because it actually ties in the fate of our creation with the fate of mankind, right? That just as we are longing and yearning for things to be made right, creation itself is also doing the same. Creation is also longing to be redeemed, right? And the fate of creation is tied into our fate. And you know, whenever I get the opportunity to do this, you know, I always want to talk about this because, you know, in addition to the Holy Spirit, uh, I think the other commonly misunderstood, misunderstood doctrine, right, is the doctrine of heaven. And we kind of talked about this during retreat as well, but that, you know, we don't really have a good understanding of what heaven is like, right? Because popular culture or cartoons, right, they give us a really, really bad understanding of what heaven may be like. And, uh, and what, what we see here is that heaven is going to be a physical place, right? Sometimes we just think of heaven as the spiritual place, which is all floating around, you know, and, but what we see here is that if creation is longing to be redeemed, Right, just as we are longing for things to be made right. right. What this means is that heaven is also going to be a physical place. Right, this is why in Revelation, right, Paul talks about the fact that there's going to, or, or yeah, John talks about the fact that there's going to be a new heavens and new earth. Right, we just, just, sometimes we just think, oh, there's going to be a new heaven. But no, it says that there's going to be a new earth as well. And I can't tell you exactly what it's going to look like. But I do know that in heaven... Right, I'll be able to come up and I'll recognize you. I can shake your hand. I can give you a hug. Because we're going to look like, in some ways, we're going to have resurrected bodies. We're going to be able to recognize each other. In the same way, just as we'll be able to recognize one another in heaven, in some ways, we're going to be able to recognize earth. Right? Because the earth is also being recreated. It's also being redeemed. Right? Just as we are going to have our resurrected bodies, the heaven and earth, the earth is also going to have its resurrected earth. And this, and, and this passage right, clearly shows us 
right, that, that there's going to be a new physical earth in heaven, right? And this is going to be a place where we can work and play and live, right, but all without sin, right? That the new heavens and the new earth, right, is going to be a place, is going to be a physical place similar to the one we have here, right? It's earth remade, renewed, made new in the same way that we will be. And in some ways, I should you know, really talk about heaven a little bit more, right? Because if it's not something that we are eagerly anticipating, if we're not looking forward, right? And this is actually where I think we can allow our imaginations to really kind of run wild in terms of what is heaven going to be like? Because if we don't really have a good understanding of heaven, right, we're not going to be eager. We're not going to want, you know, for Jesus to return, and so as we look at this, this passage, right, I think it shows us that because creation is also waiting to be redeemed, right, what it means is that there's going to be a new earth without corruption where we can explore, where we can live and work and play, right, all without sin and with a perfect relationship with God, right, and I think that is actually a much more accurate picture uh, of heaven. But if we, you know, if we go back to verse 22, uh, it's probably a little bit of a weird example to our ears, right? But Paul uses the analogy of childbirth, right? And uh, which is also the, you know, from, from the curse to women. Uh, but he uses the example of childbirth to say, you know, I think what he's saying here is that all of our suffering has a purpose, right? If you think, if you think about it, when a mom, you know, suffers through the incredible pains of childbirth, it's not without a purpose, right? Because there's a beautiful child to be born, in the same way Paul is using this, right? He's saying that all creation is groaning, but it's not without a purpose, right? Because we're looking forward to this new life uh, in the new heavens and new earth. And so, you know, he says that creation is groaning, right? Creation is waiting for its redemption. But of course, we are as well, right? And this is where Paul is going in verse 23. He says, uh, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Uh, you know, it seems like, you know, the older I get, uh, the, the more I groan. <laughs> you know, the older I get, the more there is to groan about. Um, you know, I noticed recently, I don't know if this is just because I hit a certain age, but uh, I've realized that much greater percentage of my conversations with others is just complaining about our bodies, <laughs> like, and how everything hurts. You know, I don't know if it's just like, I finally reached that age where like, I don't know, maybe like 10% of my conversation with people is just like, dude, my body hurts. You know, it's just, <laughs> you know, for this or that. And I love how during retreat, uh, Helen uh, reminded everyone to take their medication uh, because, you know, I heard, you know, I heard that after you reach a certain age, you know, a much greater percentage of your conversations with others is comparing the medications that you're on. You know, it's like, hey, what do you want? What are you taking right now? What do you do? What is that for? Oh, does that work? You know, I heard, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. That sounds true. Uh, you know, sounds like a lot to look forward to. Um, but... Right, so it's not just our physical bodies that groan, right? So like, you know, I'm getting, as I'm getting older, and there's a lot to groan about, but uh, we also groan due to relationships, right? There's a lot to groan about, you know, the older we get, right? And so even due to maybe uh, not so great relationships with others, you know, it also causes us to groan, right? Whether it's family, whether it's friends, whether, you know, with spouse, whether, you know, with, with anyone. You know, sometimes I look at my kids um, and I'm jealous at the ease in which they can make friendships. You know, like, you know, in the playground and they'll just be like, hi, would you like to play with me? And they're like, sure. And then like, voila, he's got friends. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, man, I wish like a friendship as adults would be like just as easy. Like, can I just go up to one of you and be like, hi, do you want to play with me? <laughs> you know, and like, yeah, we could be friends. Well, I guess it's not that different, right? <laughs> Maybe we just use, you know, different words. But, you know, but relationships, right, can cause a tremendous amount of uh, groaning in our lives. But not only that, you know, the, you know, the more that you get to know any organization, including the church, uh, there's more to groan about. The more you see in the world, the more news that you read, right, there's more to groan about, there's more to lament over. And, you know, I've been telling people that uh, if I don't watch myself, you know, I think it would be really, really easy for me to turn into that cynical, grumpy old grandpa, you know, who's just like walking around grunting at everything, you know, hitting things with my cane. You know, like, I'm like well on my way there because like, there's just like so many things. I'm just like, oh, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is bad, this is not going well. Right, and so this is what, you know, this passage is saying, right? It's like, there is just this deep groaning that we have in our lives. And the older that we get, the more that there is to just lament over. And hopefully... By the power of the Holy Spirit, I won't end up as that, you know, old, you know, old grumpy grandpa. But, you know, th there is, but that, there is that reality, right, of that gut-wrenching sadness. 
And that most likely that's going to continue to deepen as we get older. Right? As we're going to look around the world and just be like, this is not the way it was supposed to be. We look at our bodies, we look at our relationships, we look at our families, just this is not the way that it's supposed to be. You know, but hopefully, as we, you know, there's more to groan about, there's more to lament over, hopefully at the very same time, the hope that is in us through Christ will also rise at the same time. Right? That there'll be more to groan about, but yet the hope that we have in Christ will also you know, go up e- equally. And this is kind of what Paul is saying here, right? That we groan inwardly, but, at, but and we groan inwardly as we, but then we eagerly await for the adoption as sons, as sons and daughters, right? We groan, but yet it makes us eagerly and patiently wait for redemption. You know, I think this is why people say the older that you get, uh, you know, sometimes the more you, time you spend in the Psalms, uh, because the, in the Psalms you have this dynamic, right? You have this longing for things to be better. But yet in every psalm, it also ends with hope, right? That there's hope uh, in God. All right, so this is what Paul is saying here in Romans uh, as well, right? And he says, you know, now hope that is seen is not hope, right? If you have something, you don't really need to hope for it. For who hopes in what he sees? For we hope, uh, for if we hope in what we do not see, we wait for it with patience, right? The sufferings and groanings and longings, uh, they're going to grow in our lives. But hopefully alongside with that, so should hope. Right, hope grows alongside with that as well. Right, so you see here, the hope is not the goal is not to minimize you know our suffering, but to actually be able to face our suffering, face all the suffering that is going on in the world with the hope of the gospel. But you know that's not all that the Spirit does, and let's finally take a look at this last section uh, that, um, that that Paul continues to go on to see what does the Spirit do in our lives. All right, so in verse twenty six it says. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we ought to, uh, to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes with us with groanings too deep for words, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You know, the older I get, the more I find myself praying uh, this prayer as well, because, um, you know, the more there, there are things to groan about, the less I know how to pray for those things, right? Sometimes just the, the problems that people have or the issues that are facing our world today, sometimes they're just so big, right? The more you know, the more you realize that these issues are just so much bigger, and sometimes I just don't know, even know how to pray for them, you know? And I actually spend a lot of time, you know, where I actually just say, God, I actually just don't know how to pray, you know? And, you know I just don't have the wisdom, you know, to pray for this situation uh, as I should, Right? And if I could be as wise as John and to know how to pray for you know, the wars that are going on and you know, just you know, Israel. It's like sometimes I just look at it and I'm just like, I don't know. I'm like, why am I supposed to pray for? And then people you know, have you know, issues in there. It's just like sometimes it's just like, you know, sometimes it just like seems so not right just be like, oh, I hope everything goes okay. Right? It's like it's not enough. Right? It's not enough to simply pray that way. Right? And so I often find myself praying this. It's just like, God, you know, there's a situation I just don't know how I'm supposed to pray for this. And I think that's okay, right? I think sometimes it's just okay to sit with that, right? To see that issue, to see that relationship, and just be like, God, I just don't know how to pray. In some ways, I, you know, I think of Ecclesiastes 5, 2, you know, where it says, for God is in heaven and you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. Right? And sometimes we just have to admit, right, that we don't even know what to ask for. We don't even know what the next steps uh, should be. But as it says in verse 27, all right, over there, right, it says that uh, whatever situation we find ourselves in, we know that the Spirit is interceding for us according to the will of God. Right? The Holy Spirit is interceding on our behalf. And in some ways, that can be a scary thing as well, right? Because you know, how are you sure that you want God's will to be done? Right, what can make us so confident that we can pray, God, let your will be done? How do we know that we can trust God? And, and, and this is where we get the very famous Romans 8, 28, right, where it says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, this verse does not mean, you know, this verse has been interpreted in so many different ways, right? But this verse does not mean that good things happen to good people. Right, that's not what it means. This verse doesn't mean that, hey, not, things aren't that bad. Right? It's going to all work out in the end. Right? That's also not what it means. Right? Nor is Paul saying that everything that happens to us is good. Right? Paul's not saying that suffering is good. But he's saying, what he is saying is that all things work together. Both good and evil work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. 
right? On the micro level, right, in, in the everyday of our lives, we often don't know why certain things happen to us. But what we do know is God is at work, bringing restoration to us and to the world. And, and how do we know, right? How do we know then that God is working all things together for good, right? How do we know we can trust Romans 8, 28? Well, the reason is because of verses 29 and 30, all right? So don't just read Romans 8, 28, and it's, if you're memorizing it, also memorize, you know, 29 and 30, uh, because this is, why, this is why we can trust that God is working all things for our good. Because 29 and 30 says this, it says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This passage has been called the golden chain of redemption. And the reason why it's been called the golden chain of redemption is because notice that there's nothing that breaks the chain. Right? Those he foreknew, he predestined. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Right? There's absolutely no break along that chain. And one of these days, you know, we're coming to the end of the sermon, and you know, maybe not the great, best time to bring up predestination. And one of these days, we'll take a deep dive into predestination. But simply, you know, I want to end with this, right? That, that the calling that God, you know, so if you look at this, right? So God foreknew, he predestined. Those who predestined, he called. But those, the calling of God in our lives right, is a very personal one. You know, sometimes we just, you know, you know, sometimes we can go to a wedding, for example, and like we barely know the bride and groom, right, because maybe we're like a plus one, you know, or something. But when we're invited to God's family, when we're invited to God's banquet, right, that's not so with God. When he invites you, right, it is a personal calling in your life to be, adopted, to be his adopted son or daughter, right? God's calling in our lives is always personal, right? That God has specifically called you, right? This is why we do testimonies, right? How has God called you? How has God brought you to himself? And if God has called you, right, those whom he calls, that he justifies. And what it means is that you can be confident of your standing before God, right? This is the whole point of Romans, right? The righteousness of God is in you. And so those that he called, he justified. You can know as a, without, beyond a shadow of doubt that the righteousness of God is in you. And because he called you and justified you, we know that the end is also secure, right? That you will be glorified. Now next week, uh, Tim is going to preach uh, to us where God is clearly going to say, right, that no one can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. But this is why we can trust him. This is why we can trust God when he says that all things are working together for your good. You can't always see it, right? In every single specific situation, you're, you might not be sure, how, God, how is this going to be for my good? Right? We don't always know. The reason why we can trust him right, is because of this golden chain that, that because you've been called, because you've been justified, you will be glorified. And as we'll hear next week, no, nothing can separate us from the love of God. You know, if you haven't put your trust in Christ, right, each one of us uh, has heard his calling uh, in our lives. If you haven't put your trust in Christ and you hear his calling to you in your life, I want to simply invite you to come before him now right, and say, God, I believe in you, I trust you, and I know that you are my Lord and Savior. And for those of us you know, who have put our trust in him, let us also celebrate this new life that we have in the Holy Spirit. Right, because no matter what you are going through, may the Holy Spirit give you a hope that is eager, patient, and persevering as we look forward to the glory that is awaiting us in the new heavens and new earth. And may that hope that we have in Christ give you encouragement for your life today, wherever you are. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for uh, just your, uh, these wonderful verses that we find uh, in Romans. Uh, and Father, we thank you that you uh, never hold back in describing what our life is now. Um, that, that as many joys as there are in life, uh, we also know that there is many suffering, uh, sufferings that we have endured and we may endure in the future uh, as well. And Father, I just pray for my brothers and sisters that you would give us this hope that is unwavering, this hope that gives us confidence knowing that you're working all things uh, for our good. Father, help us to be able to trust you uh, in that. 
Help us to be able to have the faith to see your hand at work through all the ups and downs of our lives. For we know the ending is secure, that we will one day uh, be able to be with you in the new heavens and new earth. Father, may that hope fill us right now uh, with great encouragement for our lives uh, today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Wayne. Please stand for the song of response.